Hello. Welcome, agents on the run, agents with concrete boots, and double agents to episode 480 of an unearthly podcast, streaming live on the 23rd of May 2023, and featuring Children of Earth Day 2, written by Russell T. Davies and starring John Barrowman as Captain Jack Harkness, Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper, and Gareth David Lloyd as Yanto Jones. I am Bill Sylvia, the one in black, and with me are color commentator Alex Fireheart. Hey there. And technical director Mad Matt Winchell. I slowly die, I live again. So as happens when you're when uh, the cast is limited down to the minimum number of people that we can have for an actual podcast. It has been about five weeks since we last streamed. Nice. Um, should I start with the bad news, or do we want to give personal updates first? I guess we should probably just start with that and then go into personal stuff uh, uh, okay. surrounding that, I suppose. Um, so as of April 28th in the evening... Ron San, who had uh, recently retired from the podcast due to personal and health-related issues, um, did uh, die, presumably due to those same issues, although I didn't ask for specific details. I just didn't think they were necessary or that it was necessarily uh, appropriate to ask for. Um, but, right, yes, Ron San is officially with us no more, um, and yeah, he definitely will be missed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally know a few things of what went on um, I, again I don't want to spread anything that anyone might not want to know um, mm -hmm. I will say that bef the week before we knew everything was going down I had actually gotten in a chance to visit him since he moved in closer to where I am living currently. Like, he was literally right. two towns over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I got to visit him. I dropped him off some Taco Bell. Uh, he didn't eat anything, but he did uh, start slurping on the drink. So he was at least getting something in the system. Um, and while he was a little bit in and out of it already at that point, I will say that it did not stop him from being him. <laughs> Okay. Um, me and my mother had walked in to visit. She had finally gotten the seat and then looked up at the TV that he had playing and went, oh, that's one of the Avengers movies. Which one is it? To which Randy's comment was, the first one, the good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's our color commentary, boy. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, I believe there's going to be no official funeral. I will say that, yep. uh, Randy was kind of against that kind of thing. He felt it was gotcha. a little unnecessary. I do believe, uh, his mother is planning to try and get the, uh, his ashes scattered in the places he wanted them taken to though. Mm. So, uh, if I do hear anything about that, uh, or she, we, uh, you, uh, I'll tell you otherwise. Otherwise, I believe, if anything, his mother might post something if something does go down on Facebook, and she's mm -hmm. willing to talk. Mm. She was a bit distraught. Aaron and me have been, been sitting here going, brace yourselves, for quite a while, to be mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I believe one of our other mutual friends, uh, Sarah, was also quite distraught. Mm -hmm. I um, know that um, when I finally saw something that confirmed it, because I know Aaron gave us that little uh, warning of, like, they're not sure he'll make it through the night thing. Mm -hmm. Um I was like, I was bracing myself, but then when we didn't get any follow up here, and I'm rarely on Facebook, um, it was several days later when I finally read it something was about, that confirmed it. It was a little over a day. Yeah, she said it, she said he <clears> might <throat> not make it through the night, and then a little over a day later, 
she confirmed mm. that uh, he had passed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it might have been two days just because of time zone differences. I don't know. No, it was <laughs> it was, it was uh, like just over 24 hours. I think she was like right. 3 o'clock the day before. <laughs> she was like, oh, yeah. I think he's in serious condition. It was 5 o'clock mm. the next day. He right. Was gone. That's what I'm saying. It might sleep yeah. cycles, time time zones, etc. Mm. Um, mm. but I know when I finally like as much as I was like bracing myself for it, I was actually at work when I found out and I kinda went into shock. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Which I didn't I wasn't prepared for. Like I was like I knew it had hit me, but it was just like of all the reactions I would have, I would not have expected going into mild shock. Gotcha. Um, so that was very like, oh. Did you end up having to go home or? Oh, like thankfully, I it was at the end of my shift anyway. Gotcha. So it wasn't um, like you had a whole lot left to do. See, yeah, honestly, mm-hmm. if I had had more work time left, I probably would have just been like, okay, this just you know, happened and I don't think I'm going to be able to keep working today. Can I just go? Mm-hmm. I, w- I will say, though, too, that uh, I like I said, I'd seen him the week before and mm-hmm. as this is all going down, I was thinking to myself, damn it. Literally had left him with promises of, hey, your mom's coming to see you next week. Get your paperwork stuff done and all ready and get some time with her. And then I'll start setting up something a little more official with you next week. And didn't even get that far. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, his mom mm-hmm. had to come down early. Mm. Yeah, with me, it was more, it was very similar to when my mom passed. It was in the sense of like, we knew that, you know, he's had a shitty year and a half. Um, three weeks mm-hmm. ago, he had kind of, three weeks beforehand, he had kind of confirmed like, you know, one way or another, he didn't expect to make another year. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of all of my emotional stages had been gone through. So I was more to the point of like, okay, finally, he's not, he no longer has to deal with this shit anymore. Mm-hmm. Was the, was, yeah. was, was where I was feeling when, when Aaron gave us that announcement. So I didn't, I didn't have any of the more complicated things left to go through uh, emotionally mm-hmm. by then. And it kind of did that beforehand. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it's why my reaction of going into mild shock kind of threw me because I was like, we've had, I've, I've known the writing's been on the wall for a while. So it was like, I figured that it would be one of those things where I'd, my mood would drop, but I would other be, otherwise have that sort of thing of like, okay. I've been rationalizing this in my head for a while. He's no longer in pain. Mm-hmm. He doesn't put up with this shit anymore. So at least there's that silver lining. But even then, it just like hit me like a brick wall, and it was just like, God damn. Mm-hmm. If if anything, I will say the overwhelming sensation I had for at least a couple of days was just how pissed off I was at the Madison area healthcare system oh yeah mm. because oh, yeah. that I is had, the I leading reason well. for all yeah. of it i mean i know i mm. don't necessarily like it's it's hard to guess what condition he would have been in um if it, if the system were better and this is partially the area it's partially the whole the way the u.s system is set up mm. but at the very least even if even if it ended in the same way he would not have had as shitty of a past year and a half if yeah. we had a proper, decent health, uh, a, a healthcare system that actually is designed to care about people, and, well, and th- I'm that's... not that's not to say none of the doctors did, but the system itself, ignoring the people, yeah. is yeah. not about caring for people. Yeah, and that's the, the thing that absolutely gets me though the most is because he was being taken care of in one of the places that's supposed to be one of the best places to take care of you. Mm-hmm. Literally mm-hmm. in the system that they're learning how to best take care of you, even, and they treated him like that. That was just mm-hmm. absolutely, yeah, failure on every yeah. level. There, there's no way this should have gotten this far the way it did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's. I mean, 
honestly, like, it's only a matter of luck in terms of the difference between my mother's experience and his. And that's not to say they had very different conditions, so nothing like that. But in mm. terms of, like, the shit he went through with not being able to go back to his apartment and then being like, oh, well, guess you're guess you're homeless until uh, something happens. Um, you know, that whole shit, like, I... It's it's honestly a miracle that my mother was able to make it up the stairs to to our apartment sometimes. So entirely a matter of luck that they didn't go through the exact same thing. And that is just kind of how the American system is set up uh, if you don't have a strong support network. Which is bullshit. Mm. <clears throat> um, yeah. si since you since you mentioned his mother coming. I do just want to say, based on the update Aaron gave us, it sounds like his mother was with him when he died. So yes, she was at least yeah. close by. Right. So so there's that. There wasn't the like being on the way and it happened or something like that. There's at least that small mm. uh, mm. solace. Uh, yeah, his mother was there for at least like a good half a day already before it happened, and mm -hmm. Aaron was almost there. It, it, right. He knew she was on the way. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Erin, sadly, due to her work, could not get the full day off, but due to seeing how mm -hmm. bad his condition was, she was able to convince her bosses that she could get a half day and was able to start mm -hmm. leaving early. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I would add, uh, Erin pretty much asked me straight up right away, um, within about a week afterwards, um, looking to clean out stuff, would you be interested in taking care of the Doctor Who collection? Um, the entire collection is now in the another bedroom in the house. Uh, still backed gotcha. up at the moment, but it's protected and in a nice shady room. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've I've inherited quite the set of DVDs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are being taken care of. I believe there's other things Aaron's like trying to find good homes for, and a couple other things mm -hmm. like headsets and stuff that never got used or opened that she's basically looking for quick sale to friends and so forth. Got you. Since they're in still good condition. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, that I guess that's about all I got really to say on yep. that other than putting together a music thing which uh, I was already working on as soon as I knew things were up and that's basically one of my coping mechanisms these days is Mm. putting tracks together mm -hmm. like I do. Okay. Mm. Um, since we've already started a little bit, um, since some of it kind of segued into, uh, you know, your your home, um, how, want, uh, any, any updates you want to give over the past five weeks? <laughs> Jeez, what do I say? Um, mm. Work lost a person, got a few extra hours over the next couple of weeks. Um, I believe that, yeah, I, be I mentioned that I have availability for the show for the next two weeks at least so i'll be done like early evening late uh, mid afternoon the next couple of weeks in time for the show so i should have plenty of time to get home eat and watch what i need to watch for the episode all right um, should we get three three weeks in a row of uh depressing torchwood Ooh. yeah um uh, other than that i'm Try, uh, I actually I'm getting like almost every other day off if I can get my stuff in gear I can actually finally poss possibly finish a game which I've been struggling to get through and find the time for for like the last year or so I've been sitting on Thief 3 for quite a while I'm I swear mm. I'm in like the last several uh, sour, sour, several hours of the game now it started stuttering like Porky Pig um, but, uh, yeah, I'm hoping to finally get that done and be able to finally get to another game. That and, uh, one well, of my coworkers should have more time to stream, uh, Elden Ring with me. All right. Uh, Alex? Um, honestly, I haven't really been up to much beyond, mm -hmm. uh... Just video gaming and shit. Finally started watching, um... Oh, God, what was it? Like, I don't know why, but for some reason I randomly went through... 
when I was keeping my dog company while my parents were out of town for a couple of days, um, and I got through all the Underworld movies, <laughs> which was, like, almost in one sitting, I think. Because I'd already seen the first one, so I skipped it. But I watched... And I'd, technically I'd seen the prequel, but I decided to watch it. Um... And that that franchise is kind of all over the place, but <laughs> that's why you're um, too. Yeah, uh, I'll put it this way: there's one movie that hits really weird to watch now because of COVID, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, uh, but yeah, that aside, and I think uh, yeah, I also started JoJo's Bizarre Adventure finally, um. That aside, it's mainly been watching Critical Role, and I started watching a thing called L.A. by Night, which is a uh, Vampire the Masquerade thing. Hmm. So that's been interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah, pretty much aside from that, it's just been work and that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I might actually be trying to get time off work. <laughs> soon because i've got like i still don't know what the hell it is and it only ever really seems to like really flare up at work but it's like a a pain in my back somewhere hmm. that i can only really tell where it is when i'm at work because the cold from the air conditioning gets into it and makes it flare up <clears throat> to the point wow. that i've had to like whatever I mean, kind of air quotes heavy lifting because it's just emptying bins. Um, I've had to basically just kind of take the initiative to be like, I am not doing that and anymore until this goes away because uh, I do not want to make it any worse, potentially. Especially mm -hmm. if it is like, when I've talked to people about it before, I still haven't gone to a doctor about it yet, but... Like, I think when I described it to my dad once, he was like, oh, it could be a pinched nerve. I mean, it could also just be that I've pulled something that just hasn't been able to heal up yet. But yeah, <clears throat> it's just like, well, that's really annoying to deal with. So hopefully I'll be able to. I do know, I do know that, that the, from my litmus of other people that pinched nerves can take a very long while to like get out of that spot. Mm. and unpinch itself so it might mm. be that but I would still say that you should probably get checked out as soon as possible yeah cause like it was fairly negligible to start with but yeah like the longer it's gone the more <clears throat> just being in the air conditioning I'll get to work and suddenly oh there it goes <laughs> Oh, and then I'll oh, get harm off and not for a while. <laughs> mm. And like, it's not like unbearable. It's kind of like enough that I'm just kind of internally just like, this is really fucking annoying. And then they're, but they're like, now that I'm not doing bin runs anymore, it's gone from what it was some days where it would be like internal screaming. <laughs> like, I'd be able to mask it very well and they wouldn't think anything's wrong. But I'm like, internally, I'm just like, wow, you know, if I could rip this arm off right now, that'd be great. Uh. Mm, yeah. <laughs> My sinuses. <laughs> on, on, on the note of pain... I have been having uh, headaches for the past couple weeks, and I've been trying to figure out whether it's due to lack of sleep, the way in which I sleep. Uh, when I looked it up, it said it could be stress. Mm -hmm. um, it could mean I need more fiber in my diet, or it could mean mm -hmm. I need an MRI. So it could be pretty much <laughs> anything. If I wanted yeah. to be a conspiracy theorist, I would say that it's related to the lack of Wi-Fi, and that there's some <laughs> some some whatever is stopping the Wi-Fi in my building is also causing the headaches. Um, but as a rational person, I'm pretty sure that's not true. It's not a doomer. And yes, I, I I have not said this on on stream yet. 
Um, I've been using mobile hotspot for my Wi-Fi for the past two and a half weeks. If my voice cuts out in the middle of the podcast or I can't open up a news article, that's why. Um, and yeah, it's annoying. And uh, hopefully both of those things are resolved soon. Um, if need be, I'm going to email my doctor because I can't just take a migraine pill every day because then eventually you just start um, getting headaches on every day you don't take a pill, regardless of if there's a reason or not. And I don't want to get to that mm. that position. Right. Um, that that of your body might mm -hmm. build up a tolerance to where the tablets yeah. don't work. Right. Yeah, it builds up a tolerance or a dependence, and I don't necessarily yeah. want either. Um, mm, a migraine that said every my... day, me going without <laughs> caffeine for 24 hours. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that said, my semester has ended, so I've... I still have a bunch of deadlines over the summer, but I've kind of taken a, uh, a mini-vacation in the sense that I've just, like, over the past two weeks, I've probably had about five days where the most strenuous thing I did was play Undertale. Um, which I, I've beat uh, Undertale in neutral mode, which I thought would be harder, cause just considering the uh, the bullet hell portions. Um, but I beat neutral mode, and then I beat pacifist mode. And then I'm like, okay, let me take a break before trying genocide, genocide again. Um, but I can now finally say that I've beaten Undertale and not just watched videos about it. All right. Any last updates before we go on to today's show? Other than major. All right. Um, so we've covered our channel update. Uh, we have birthdays and lost stories, which, um, yeah, you, you may want to, if you haven't looked at that, Alex, you may want to uh, <laughs> find the important bits because it's written in a kind of a long form way. Uh, we have some, uh, we have some, our Doctor Who news, a bit of geek talk, and then we have our episode summary review, final thoughts and ratings. Um, and the birthdays are very abbreviated because it's been five weeks and I didn't want a 25 <laughs> Page name list. list. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but yes, uh, with the birthdays, we go to back to the 20th of April. Uh, and have Louise Jameson, who played uh, Leela of the Sever Team, um, and I guess still does technically on Big Finish, uh, turned 72. Uh, on the 21st of April, we had Gerald Flood, uh, the voice of Chameleon, who would have been 96, but died in 1986 at the age of 61. On the 27th of April, we have Jenna Coleman, played Clara Oswald, and the various Clara clones, uh, turned 37. God, she was younger than I thought. <laughs> um, You're younger than me. <laughs> uh, on the, also on the 27th, we have Russell T. Davies, the executive producer from 05 to 09, and returning as well from this year onwards for god knows how long um turned 60 um and then in may we have on the first of may sasha dewan the master from 2020 to 2022 i mean he may come back but we don't know <laughs> kind of probably unlikely but i hope he does um never know he turned 39 um, also on the 1st of May, we have Joanna Lumley, who was the 13th Doctor in Curse of Fatal Death, turned 77. Uh, on the 5th of May, we have Richard E. Grant, uh, the 10th Doctor in Curse of Fatal Death, uh, Dr. Simeon and the Great Intelligence in Series 7, and was also the 9th Doctor in Scream of the Shalka, I think. Ah, uh, yes, I missed that one. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, turned 66. Um, also on the 5th, we have Delia Derbyshire, who was who made the original title music, arranged the original title music for Doctor Who. Uh, would have been 86, but died in 2001 at the age of 64. 
And finally, on the 12th of May, we have Catherine Tate, who played and still plays Donna Noble, uh, turned 55. Uh, so happy birthday to all of those folks. Um, and we also have a lost story. Uh, Murray Melvin, uh, who died. Ooh, I didn't get a chance to peruse this. But I'm assuming... 14th of April. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, he had a long and distinguished career in theatre, film, and TV. Uh, let see, what if I can get out of this? Um, apparently, he was a... It's, big... he, he, wor he worked for Big Finish, okay. so not, not everything there mm. is going to is Doctor Who related, but mm. some of it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, apparently he showed up in shows like The Avengers no not that one <laughs> uh, and Jonathan Creek as well as a, playing Bill's Manger in Torchwood oh, Big Finish stuff oh in Torchwood Big Finish okay that makes sense mm. oh no wait looking at his face that is the one from yeah. live action Torchwood as well so why mm -hmm. I'm surprised so I'm surprised Doctor Who News dot net didn't cover his didn't cover him. Mm. Maybe they thought it was Might too much of a character because he only appeared like once or twice. They they've yeah. covered people who appeared in much smaller roles. Hmm. Mm. I don't know then. Might be that it went under their particular radar or something. Right. I don't know. Might slip past them if there's a, um. enough news that week. Yeah. And yeah, he's still going to be a part of the forthcoming Among Us series. Hmm. I assume all of his bits were already recorded before this happened. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Since you say you have Avengers, not that one, we've covered a lot of people who appeared in the BBC Avengers. Have hmm. we covered anyone who appeared in the Marvel Avengers? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, oh wait, technically, um, Jenna Coleman. I was gonna say, uh, hmm. does Jenna count? Because when yeah. it comes to birthdays, yes, we have. Yeah. <laughs> that was in the one, the a couple of the Avengers movies. Yes, those ones. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I, I hmm. don't. I hope we're not doing this podcast when we cover Jenna Coleman's death. Yeah. Oh, uh, you never know. That's true. Mm. No, I don't know. It depends on how long we can milk this thing for and how many weeks <laughs> we keep missing. <laughs> Heck, I was already worried that we're going to be out of content period by now, but uh, delays are delays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so moving on to our... Uh, Doctor Who episode news. We've got a bit, a few things on the 60th anniversary special. Uh, to start with, we can confirm the return of Murray Gold, the composer for the Russell T. Davies and uh, uh, Stephen Moffat eras of Doctor Who. Uh, he will be working on the 60th anniversary special and also. They say fortieth season. I don't. I'm guess. Uh, is that's probably adding that. Well, that would have. It's e yeah. either. A, I'm like that's count, either a typo or it's adding up both shows, and I don't have the mental it's, capacity. It's at adding. The moment. I think <laughs> I worked it out a, a few weeks back. That yeah, like if you count, mm -hmm. if the numbering had stayed consistent, we would be up to season forty of okay. Doctor Who. Was, ser series fourteen would be series. 40 overall mm -hmm. i think it was so if he's covering series 14 and the 60th we can probably just assume that he's uh here on uh, you know he, he at full time until we hear otherwise mm. so we've talked a lot 
about whether Murray Gold would return or not. I think this is the first time I've seen a photo of him. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely have mixed feelings because you know we we yeah. hit, we've enjoyed his work, um, but this kind of makes it even more feel like when RTD and his team retire, there will be nobody left that can knows how to make the show. Yeah. It, do, um, it does kind of smack of that, and, it kind of, and honestly, I, it feels like that because that's what caused us to start making this podcast in the first place. <laughs> because we all thought that the people who were in charge were deranged. <laughs> they obviously didn't know what they were doing, and so we had to comment. Hmm. I mean, like, for me, I just feel bad for the the guy that Murray Gold's effectively replacing. Like, maybe he was only ever going to be there when Chibnall was. And I know some people, like, weren't keen on his stuff, but, like, honestly, I know, like, I think I once saw someone say it's like, oh, but he was basically just doing background music. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's kind of what I want. And, like, after seeing so much classic Who, it's... Like it kind well, of struck me one day of oh that's the approach he was taking it's all ambient mm -hmm. music. Well, the problem is, is than... that even though it's ambient music, it's not really good ambient music. You you can think back to like the old classic Who stuff, and you'll actually remember some melodies and stuff from back then. I can't remember a single lick from the last <laughs> ten years of Doctor Who. Literally, the last melodies I remember sticking in my craw for Doctor Who were literally Murray Gold stuff, like right towards near the end. So, as far as I I'm mean, concerned, it's actually going to be going back to more decent music again for the show. I mean, I guess for me, I've, I felt like there's some stuff I'll rewatch and be like, wow, this is really heavy on themes and not just like does this music fit this particular thing? Mm. Or like, did this scene need music? Because a lot of scenes in Classic Who hit as well as they do because there's no music. So Which like, is the, pretty... When the music like, happens, it stands out. That was a lot more common in those days and is pretty well, rare yeah. on TV nowadays. So mm. that's, I think, part of what the uh, people, you know, the producers are looking at when they make these decisions. Hmm. That said, I don't know if um, I honestly do not know whether British audiences have the same same stereotype as American audiences with uh, producers being afraid. Oh, there's three whole seconds with nobody talking. Uh, we better fix that. We better put some noise in there. <laughs> don't know. I mean, I feel like that, it would. I think they have some of yeah. the same issues. Mm. I think it would depend on the show. Like, for something like mm. Doctor Who, I could see them maybe having that attitude now. Mm. Um, whereas, like, I mean, I guess to keep it related to stuff that people have done on this, I would assume, while I haven't seen it, that something like It's a Sin probably has moments of quiet because it's more dramatic. And, like... I've only seen the first series of it, I think, but Broadchurch probably also has that as well. But it's also more dramatic, so having, like, moments of silence makes more sense. Whereas they would go, no, this is supposed to be action-y or whatever, so we have to have, like, you know, go, 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 go. <laughs> All right, our next uh, bit of news for the 60th is we have the announcement of... Jamie Hayden, who uh, is sometimes credited as Jamie Cho, uh, who has been confirmed as appearing as uh, Colonel Chan uh, or Chan in uh, the 60th anniversary as what looks like a uh, space cop. Oh, no, unit soldier. Sorry. Uh, so he's a unit colonel uh, who is uh, affected by something related to uh, Beep the Meep. Hmm. Uh, I know I've seen it mentioned that that was a reference to something that happened in those comics. Uh, let's see who appears alongside Ronak Patani, who plays unit soldier Major Singh. 
Um, so we are, as far as we know, these are in the first special, um, the Star Beast, although we haven't gotten to the titles yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I did confirm the right name on IMDb, but I forgot to see if I knew him from anything. And let's see. Looks like he appeared in several uh, Batman movies as stocky Asian man, so that's not a very mm -hmm. uh, standout role. So, um, and looking looking at his uh, IMDb, it looks like the majority of his roles seem to be that sort of thing. Um, characters without names or given names like barman, things like that. So, a lot of background characters. Uh, Maybe he'll be playing a very similar role in this uh, story. Um, he's also played, uh, he's also done stunts apparently, so maybe he'll be doing some stunt acting in this story. Possible. Uh, and that is about it for Jamie Hayden. Uh, and as I kind of alluded to, the big news about the 60th is we've gotten a new trailer. Which included the announcement that Special 1 was named the Star Beast, Special 2 was named Wild Blue Yonder, and Special 3 was named The Giggle. Uh, RTD referred to them as being three hours of danger, so presumably each of them is going to be an hour, or at least an average of an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on the trailer? I mean, it's still not entirely that much to grasp, which I guess mm -hmm. I'm glad about because, you know, these aren't airing until November. <laughs> so I guess it's a good thing that Russell mm -hmm. is not letting too much out. Um, it's slightly more than we've got, and we have names and shit. Um, <clears throat> honestly, it's hard to really grasp much. Um, just beyond we have like a little, a little more context for stuff. I'm still wondering how the hell they're going to get around Donna being able to like recognize the doctor and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I doubt that RTD would be like, well, I did the thing once, and there was the fail safe. So now she's got to die. I doubt we're going to go that way. <laughs> it didn't look like she was dying um, in the trailer. It looked like she was able right. to carry on a conversation and keep going mm. on. I would also say that in the trailer, she literally pokes an alien, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although I guess to be fair, it's only if she does remember him. So this might just be, there won't be a, there might not be a moment where she remembers the doctor. <clears throat> they might just avoid having her remember to avoid that. So this will basically be treated like she's going on her first adventures again. Maybe. Yeah, definitely could it. I mean, it's it. It almost seemed to me like uh, she was aware that, he, that she was aware that he was returning and that she had met him before, but not. But maybe as if he had told her that. But her reactions were very much in the way that she would have been in, you know, as a first adventure. Hmm. Well, to be fair, she did see him a couple times after the whole amnesia thing mm -hmm. had happened. So. Real. So it's not that he's a completely unfamiliar face. It's just been a while. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I was trying to figure out from the way the story was cut. I couldn't tell it. I don't think it's all sequential. So it's possible that all of the Donna scenes are from the Star Beast. Um, definitely. Mm. All of, I mean, it kind of depends on whether Beep the Meep is in more than one of these episodes. But it almost seemed as if... Uh, the last part was from the giggle, but 
if so, that would mean that um, the Meep is in all three, whereas it might all just be part of the Star Beast. Hard to mm. say. Hard to say yep. for sure on that. Yeah. Um, I will say for my half of this um, that it, yeah, I don't think this trailer has given us anything we didn't already know so far outside of the different story names. Um, that being said, it's nice to see more than just still images. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is one thing they have given us now. So you can actually see some of this stuff. And honestly, whereas I was feeling there's something maybe to be worried about from a lack of information on some of the previous stuff we've seen trailers for for this show, I will say this is giving me enough to go, okay, you're not completely hiding everything, and I'm not getting red flags right now. So mm -hmm. knock on wood. Hopefully we keep going in the right direction on this one. Maybe, pay, please, please, please. A, 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 good, a, good, a good start to a good season, please. <clears throat> but we'll see. Okay, any other thoughts on the trailer? That's not basically uh, my thoughts. Hmm. All right, so that moves us on to uh, the Christmas special. Uh, so this is the Christmas special at the end of this year, the first appearances of the 15th Doctor. Uh, and we have some, inf um, some photographs taken uh, and uh, shared by Cult Box of Bristol uh, dressed up for Christmas as part of the... Uh, filming um and i think there were also some more specific things i'm scrolling down scrolling down that's right we do have a photo of shudi gatwa on set mm -hmm. a couple shots of the tardis yeah shots of the tardis i was i was ignoring that because the tardis doesn't have much in the way of costumes and things like that um Oh, yes, there's uh, a photo of Anita Dobson on set. Gotcha, and a couple Or a others. couple of them. Mm. Oh, there's a shot of Gotcha in the full jacket, too. A little bit uh, further down. Oh, yes, yep. Oh, yeah, so is that going to be his jacket? Is that. It looks like he's fully in costume, so I'm guessing that's a costume jacket. That and, if so, yeah, I think I see that's another shot new. With a minute too, and he's coming out of the TARDIS with it. So yeah. So I'm trying to blow that up on my screen to get a few more details. Can I get anything on this? So yeah, it looks like a knee-length uh, leather jacket, so like a leather duster sort of thing. Although that some of that might be the lighting. It might it might not actually be leather. Hard. Um, I'm seeing the with, it looks like it should be leather of some kind, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it, yeah. Um, with uh, regular sneakers, it looks like, a little surprising. But not unheard of by any means. Like, we've seen doctors in formal wear with sneakers. Mm. Gotta have some sort of running shoe. I, it's hard to say what the sneakers are, what the shoes are. I know there's some sort mm -hmm. of sneaker they're, of some they're, kind. They're not as, yeah, they're not as recognizable as Converse, but... <laughs> mm. And honestly, almost all the shots where I'm seeing that I could possibly have a look at them, they're half hidden underneath the little bit of a dip in the hill, so it's hard to say what they really are. Let me look at this other photo. Here's a shot that I can see a full shoe in. Hmm. Yeah, it just looks like regular sneakers for the most part. Right. Looks like, like a so G funny, yeah. on the side or something. Mm. I'm not sure what that is. Which I guess, to be honest, isn't too surprising given the doctor he's going to be following on from 
he mm. was known for wearing sneakers. So. Either way, you need just... the, the doctor needs shoes to run in, and anyhow, so yeah, yeah, proper running shoes. Right, there's a whole bunch of shots uh, of him coming out of the TARDIS. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't scrolled down that far because I was focused on the uh, costume. But these look like they're a lot more like as the, as he would look while they're filming. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if nothing else, these do seem to um, add some... Uh, sort of back up the assumption that I've seen some people have or at least speculate that maybe his doctor is going to be more fashionable um, than a lot of the other ones. Ah, well, which... there, are, there, are, there are hints to that mm -hmm. in uh, some of the other uh, photos we'll be looking at today. Mm. Which, honestly, <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I almost envisionary a uh, like a uh, like a three doctor scenario now with uh Capaldi, Jody and Gartua where it's the whole oh so you, these are my replacements are they? A dandy and a clown <laughs> Or I could see him just roasting their uh lack of fashion sense. <laughs> I mean, it is a nice contrast from Jody, who basically, like, literally got her outfit from an op shop, so. Mm -hmm. And just stuck with it no matter where she went. It's like, um, that thing clashes. <laughs> right. It's, um, <laughs> they were like, yeah, we weren't planning on her being a lesbian. I'm like, really? Because I don't know any straight women that would be caught dead in that outfit. <laughs> All right. And since these are not loading for me any more quickly and I think we've discussed all we can with the costuming. Probably time to move on to our next bit. More costuming. <laughs> yep. And this is the 60s episode. Oh, and I don't know why I'm opening the link again when I already have it open. Uh, so this is an episode uh, yeah, an episode set in the 60s and it looks uh, like most likely like the 15th Doctor and companion Ruby Sunday are in costume for the era. Nice, bro. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I would say very, probably very fashionable for the era, although... Um, I don't know how much people of that era would take to uh, the two being close to one another. <laughs> um, there is a note on the the second link I put for about this article. It appears like they've set up the street specifically to mimic the uh, uh, the that Beatles cover with them crossing the street. So oh, we might uh, get a recreation of that scene. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. It's it's funny because the first time I saw mm. these images, I was like, okay, he fits, but her hair doesn't seem very 60s to me. And like, you know, I don't really know Jack about 60s fashion and that, but I just remember oh, thinking... Oh, I, I don't mm. know. There's 60s hair that looks even <laughs> crazier than that. <laughs> you didn't like realize this hair... thing that's called a beehive, right? <laughs> well, yeah. But it was, mm. I just remember mm. thinking, like, at least with the angles we've got, I look at her and I'm just like, I don't know if, like, the face and the hair really fits. No, I, but I wasn't focused on the say. hair, but I was seeing, like, that outfit is something that I could picture um, Susan wearing. Maybe, yeah. In, in, in 60s, too, so. <laughs> But yeah, we've got I a think... lot of we've got a lot of '60s cars and things. Mm. Oh, it is kind of funny because this is like I think the the first thing that jumped out to me was like, ah, okay, so we've got Gatwa in a uh, a pinstripe suit, <laughs> which yep. I think makes him like the second Doctor now to wear one of those. <laughs> mm. 
I think Tenet's the only one to wear a pinstripe suit otherwise. Maybe. Yeah, none of the J and T era doctors would have, so. Hmm. All right. I think that's it oh. for that episode. Um, and then first, um, then we have the news that uh, Jonathan Goff uh, is confirmed as acting in the new series. Um, I do not or I might have said that wrong. Jonathan Groff. I think I didn't say the R the first time or I didn't read it. Um, it says he is an award winning star of stage and screen. Um, looks like he appeared in Glee, Hamilton, Frozen. Ah, uh, okay. Let me load up his IMDb. Yeah, I... ah, he was the he was the new version of Agent Smith in the fourth Matrix movie. Okay, well, so that would be where I know him from. <laughs> Which I mean, I I just spent the whole time like that's not Hugo Weaving, and don't rec I'm not going to recognize him. <laughs> yeah, I... should be fair, so I far think the so far the list of that, stuff though. you guys have named is all stuff I haven't seen. <laughs> he was, uh, <laughs> if anyone's seen Frozen, and he was Kristoff. Uh, One of the guys shrugged. He was no. King. Yeah. He was King George in Hamilton. Um, he was an Invincible. So a lot of that's voice acting. Mm. I don't know why he was Bart Simpson in one episode. He's uh, an, uh, oh. he was playing an actor playing Bart. <laughs> ah, in an episode of The <laughs> Simpsons. So I guess there was a Simpsons musical or something. I don't know. Or in something. in the show, I mean. Oh, there's um, been a few musical episodes in that show. No, I meant a show where they made a musical about the Simpsons or something. I mean, Possibly. whatever. An episode. This is getting just too, stop. Too you're, you're, you're you're messing yourself <laughs> up worse. <laughs> it's getting too jumbled up. Um, and I'm not recognizing any other of these roles. So it sounds nope. like he's done qu quite a bit that people would recognize just not necessarily that we would yeah mm. it's just not necessarily in our circle of usual interests mm -hmm. except mm. for one or two things which maybe we we just haven't seen yet mm -hmm. uh, and then the second link related to Groff is uh that he appears in uh this episode that um do they say when it's set they do Victorian not. Victorian era, but just by the look of it. They do. I was going to say, like, is it because Vic, Victorian? I think the dresses are poofier normally, right? Depends. <laughs> it's roughly um, Victorian era. But we have this image of Groff, Gibson, and Gatwa. Once again, they're dressed in period, so this seems like a doctor that's going to be usually in period dress rather than wearing the same costume regardless of time period at least for the historicals i'm sure the sci-fi episodes will all have uh the regular more costume regular up the, uh, yeah. Up it, yeah so it'll be mm -hmm. kind of like um did david Tennant dress in period or only rose or only the um, companions i should say only companions for the most part he just yeah. always ran around in the suit gotcha mm -hmm. I can recall. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think I think literally the only time I can recall him being in a different outfit was like, uh, oh my god, what was it again? I'm blanking. Uh, the Family of Blood stuff. Oh, right, right. when he, know, was, he was he was like, the, he when was he wasn't the doctor. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. wasn't <laughs> yeah. the doctor for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Just like when Matt Smith moved to live in the Victorian era for a while, he was wearing a more period outfit. Hmm. Um, I feel like okay, maybe I thought there was a doctor that wore period more often, but maybe I'm just thinking the companions. Um, but here we've hmm. had uh, of the episodes we've had, uh, the doctor and companion were both in period outfit. By the way, there are more photos from this episode filming, but they're mostly just different angles on uh, Ruby Sunday in the same dress. So I didn't mm -hmm. think they were worth, uh, mm. you know, spending a lot of time looking at. Mm. I will say this also, 
like this and the 60s one also kind of add more sort of credence to oh well if this doctor is more fashionable then it would make sense that he would absolutely be gung-ho to be like oh cool cool i get yeah. an excuse to dress up absolutely <laughs> like i don't think he's a doctor that's going to wear a completely different outfit for every single episode because right. that's just not great marketing yeah, yeah. but it's entirely <laughs> possible that every historical episode he goes gung-ho like that mm. I mean, also, historicals are the easier ones for you to get an outfit for them, too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, especially something like this, which is like, this is BBC's bread and butter is doing period pieces like that. So, mm. And actually, I'm wondering if this is before Victorian, because the whole, like, the short pants with the stockings, like, you see that a mm. lot in, like, uh, American Revolution uh, mm. images and reenactments and such. I'm wondering if it's closer to that time period. I mean, I will say, I was almost for a sec, I was going to look something up, because I was like, this almost looks like something out of a Jane Austen <laughs> novel, or something like that. Uh, which would have been written in, like, Victorian times, I think. But, like, mm. is set in, uh, like... Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so they Georgian were... Georgian era and region. Yeah, in the Georgian, Georgian era. era. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so maybe this is a, an, ep an episode in the Georgian era. Mm. Mm. Hard to say. I don't know. There's a lot. I don't know enough about my clothing from certain eras. Mm -hmm. I just know <laughs> somewhere back in that kind of time period. <laughs> yeah. uh, and of course, R R Ran is the history buff. He would have had something to say about that. Mm. So. We're uncultured swine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so that moves us on from... So that's the end of our episode discussion, uh, which we had quite a bit of. Uh, and that moves us on to merchandising. Merchandising. Oy. Starting with Magic the Gathering. Um, so for those who don't know, Magic the Gathering has been doing lately uh, these uh, theme sets and theme decks... Um, that are sometimes new cards based on specific sci-fi and, uh, and genre properties. And some of them are just kind of repaintings of old cards, but with like Godzilla on them or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks or like they're... land cards. And then you just sit out some other stuff to the deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like in October, they're coming out with a few commander decks based on Doctor Who. Um, and it looks like uh, they haven't really given us, you know, the flavor text or the names of these cards. Uh, but what we do have is some photos of what some of the cards will look like. Um, so hmm. just basically artwork or some of them probably some of them do look like screenshots. Um, and that ranges from photos of uh, lands to the doctors um, I see a Davros there. We see a Davros. Oh yeah, there's the lands. Lands actually look really yep. cool. Yeah, and there are there are also some basic lands. So they're really going all out in this set in the sense of it's not just the important cards like the uh, legends that are getting cards, mm -hmm. but you know we see the TARDIS in. Uh, oh yeah, that looks like an alien landscape, which is not unusual for Magic to be honest. Um, you know, things every like every that. Every single one of them has a TARDIS. <laughs> yep. Um, um, I will say that while the art looks nice, I also know that Magic the Gathering has been nickeling the diming the hell out of players lately. Also, their card stock quality has not gone up lately. Matter of fact, it's gone back to when people were uh, really harshly critiquing them for cards literally bending into a Pringle for no reason. Got you. Um, but also, I will say that while Wizards has pushed Commander really hard, I don't know many people that actually really care about Commander. There's definitely people out there that do, but apparently I've tried it's the it big and thing really for. Um, <laughs> I mean, well, I guess Commander got started because people just invented Commander like on their own, and then Wizards of the Coast was like, "Wow, this is really popular. We should start actually making it official." We'll make it official, um, we'll make our own version of the rules, and you have to play it mm -hmm. the way we want to play it. 
But yeah, I think it's specifically for, I mean, the only competitive uh, that I've ever been involved in was always um, drafts. You know, you come in and you just, you know, you, you make a new deck on the spot. But mm-hmm. I'm guessing that uh, I, I, by my understanding, commander like commander competitive is um, a big thing, at least in some places. Yeah, my my usual go to magic people really don't care for commanders, so maybe gotcha. I'm just part of that circle. Yeah, and I have tried commander a couple mm-hmm. times myself, and I'm like, this doesn't really do anything for me. Yeah, I've I've never played commander myself either. I honestly. I have not played Magic in a long time at this point. Well, as a matter of fact, actually, I'm happy I got out of playing Magic again because <laughs> the game I was playing it on suddenly got hacked like a couple months ago. No. Mm-hmm. So, so not physical Magic, you're saying? Uh, yeah, I played digital video Magic. Game. But um, because I don't... I live in the middle of nowhere. There's nowhere to play Magic around here. I have to play it online. Mm, excuse me. That's fair, that's fair. So um, yeah, that's the only but, way. Maybe maybe commander's better in person. I don't know, but it really did not thrill me. That makes sense. Um, but other than looking at the artwork, there's not a lot to talk to talk about with that story. Nah. Especially for people who don't play commander. <laughs> um on other news, the BBC has filed several trade works marks for Doctor Who, um, including for NFTs. Clothing and footwear, uh, video games, VR software and headwear, and sound and video recordings, and more. Um, so this means one of two things. One, either the BBC is planning to get into selling NFTs, or two, and this is kind of what I'm more hoping for, they're just kind of getting ahead, and this you often see this with big properties anyway, um, that they're filing these trademarks so that somebody else can't. Um, so that somebody else possible. can't. Yeah. So that you, so that you can't get somebody like we're going to make a Doctor Who board ape and sell it for money, and BBC can yeah. be like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. In short, I'm hoping yeah. what that's what, at least what's going on with the NFT thing. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it does worry me that if, well, to be fair, they also haven't been posting a lot of merch lately. But maybe they're hoping that will change. And and honestly, mm-hmm. that's why you would claim a bunch of this stuff anyways ahead of time is. Right. Claim it and then wait and hope that there's a good chance for bringing some of this back again. Yeah. But yeah, as far as I'm concerned, NFTs can rot in hell. <laughs> and I mean, and I mean like, I... sorry, go ahead. I mean, like, I would hope, especially that they, that the BBC would look at what like Square Enix did, where Square Enix sold a bunch of things off trying to go all in on NFTs and look where that's got them. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, <laughs> it's done nothing it for them. Out the but yeah, so for example, there's a lot of people who, um, there's a lot of like YouTubers that share news in the, po- in the Pokemon community. And what you'll often see with Pokemon is they'll file a trademark for a title of a game that doesn't exist so that, if they see somebody making like, you know, a Pokemon Z website and selling merch or Pokemon mm. Z bootleg games, they can be like, no, that's under our trademark and stop and stop them rather mm. than, you know, just having nothing, no, re- no legal recourse. So I'm hoping that's what the case is here. Mm, possibly, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like basically, if they were gonna actually do NFTs, they're getting in a bit late. <laughs> Way late. Because like the markets like crashed several times over. So you know, on top of it just being fucked, like it it's was shady to begin with. A matter of, yeah, <laughs> it's also just like if you were doing this because you wanted to cash in, you missed your chance. <laughs> yeah, all, all the NFT bros are now doing uh, AI. Yeah. Um, so that is it for uh, general merchandise. We also have some book news. Uh, Evil of the Daleks by Fraser Hines. This is by uh, BBC Books. This is not a Target novelization. Um, and I'm pretty sure there already is a Target novelization. So this is, um, they, they say it's an inventive new retelling 
Um, and I've seen that on multiple sites. So it sounds like it's a different take on Evil of the Daleks. Um, hmm. But other than that, I don't see a lot of details as to what's so inventive about it. Yeah, I don't it know. Mi- it might be from Jamie's point of view. Oh, no, it does say it's from Jamie's point of view. Ah, okay. Which does make sense being written by Fraser Hines. Um, which I think this is his first novel I think I saw on another page. Yeah. Oh, yes. And the target novelization was published by John Peel in 1993. So this is definitely separate from the target novelization. And um, I guess we'll have to wait and see, uh, you know, if it's worth, if it's any good. All right. Uh, In other news, this is being uh, released by Penguin. Um, there is a series of six Doctor Who novels that are basically their uh, 60th anniversary uh, celebration. They're being released in October, and each of them is set in a different novel. Um, so we have Imaginary Friends by Jacqueline Rayner, set in the 1960s. Um, and it doesn't say what Doctor that features, at least not that I'm seeing. Um, the Cradle by Tasha Suri, set in the 1970s. Or I guess, um, I guess we can probably assume based on the silhouette on each cover, right? Yeah, the first so one the looks fir- to be the first oh, Doctor. Yeah. yeah, first Doctor, the Cradle. Is that the ninth Doctor? Um, it's, mm, I can't get close enough to get a clear image of it. Although it says it's a <laughs> tall, grumpy man with white hair. So not the ninth doctor then. Hmm. Oh wait, that might be Peter Capaldi. Does he have yeah. white hair? Oh, Capaldi, yeah, he has short yeah. hair. Just yeah, I was gonna say right. it'd be like he started off short hair and kind of like grew out. Yeah. Um. Then we have the self-made band by Mark Griffiths, set in the '80s, featuring the Doctor and Romana, and of course only one Doctor traveled with Romana. Mm-hmm. Um. Then we have Wannabes, set in the 1990s. Uh, featuring the Tenth Doctor and Donna, uh, the Monster in the Cupboard. Uh, uh, that was by Dave Rodden. I don't think I said the Monster in the Cupboard by Kaylin Bayron. Uh the Doctor and Rose. Like so that would be the Ninth Doctor. Yep. The Angel of Redemption by Nikita Gill. Uh, it's a Weeping Angel story. And is that supposed to be Jody? I think it might be um, Matt Smith. I was thinking that, but too. It looks more hard. like it's Matt Smith. <clears throat> and he dealt with the, the angels more than anyone any else. Yeah. Other, so, yeah. True. Um, and that's it for that. So I am liking the color, the covers. So it does look, you know, they, yeah. it is a really interesting mm-hmm. design and the different color cover themes kind of, um, you know, they, they're different enough without being too different. So I really like that visually. Um, don't know if I'm going to read these or not, but it does look interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, a very brief note on comics. So we mentioned the Doomsday Multimedia event during, I think, our last podcast. So Titan Comics will have a two-issue special as part of that event, um, and this will be featuring Missy. Mm-hmm. So just a small note on that. Um, yeah, and then and finally... The covers, that's about all. <laughs> yep. And finally, we have Big Finish. And I did go through all the Big Finish news this time. Uh, We have uh, out on April 20, uh, Ronnie Takes on the World, written by Joseph Lidster, James Goss, and Lizzie Hopley, starring Anjali Mohindra. On May 3rd, uh, we had Once in Future, which I think is uh, a six-part series. Um, So this was the first entry, Past Lives. Written by Robert Valentine, starring Tom Baker and Sadie Miller. Uh, so that would be the fourth Doctor and uh, Su- uh, Sarah Jane. Um, then we have the ninth Doctor Adventures, Pioneers. Written by Roy Gill, Robert Valentine, and Catherine Armitage. Starring Christopher Eccleston. 
Uh, that was May 10th, I don't think I said. Woo. On May 11th, we had Torchwood Among Us Part 1, written Among by Tim Us. Foley, Ash Darby, Una McCormick, and James Goss, starring Samantha Bayart and Paul Clayton. On the 16th, we have The War Doctor Begins, Comrades in Arms, written by Timothy X. Attic, Phil Mulrine, and Noga Fleischon. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, starring Jonathan Carley and Ajaz Awad. And out, uh, well, today, as in the day we started streaming, uh, mm -hmm. The Six Doctor Adventures, Purity Unleashed, written by Matthew Sweet, Chris Chapman, and Ian Potter, starring Colin Baker and Bonnie Langford. Uh, and that is it for Big Finish releases. Um, and then finally, for Big Finish news... Uh, Big Finish has announced that they're uh, basically opening up a new era of 8th Doctor stories. Um, it seems like this is going to be set uh, between the Charlie adventures, back when uh, the 8th Doctor was part of the main range, and the uh, Lucy Miller stories, which were the first ones that were separate from the main range. Um, so it's kind of going to be uh, between the... Uh, when he looked like the movie versus when he had the new look. Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to be, uh, it's going to start off with five stories released over two box sets uh, with a new companion, um, Noblewoman Lady Audacity Montague, played by Jay Griffiths from Regency era England, uh, who's brought into the far future and a war between the Cybermen and the Vogans. And I kept, I keep thinking Vogons. Who are the Vogans again? Uh, I believe those are the guys from the Planet of Gold. Okay. So it's the uh, original Cyber War. Yeah, sounds like it. You're right. Or at least and, the same uh, parties involved. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, so I think this is Big Finish's acknowledgement that they've taken the Eighth Doctor as far as they can. Um, you know, at this point, the, the Eighth Doctor has already gone into the Time War and had multiple Time War companions. So like, okay, we're not going to retire the Eighth Doctor. So we're going to go all the way back to as early as we can without pissing people off. And without <laughs> breaking continuity and find a gap that needs filling. Yes, and that's that's... I mean, there, there's other gaps, but this is the gap that makes the most sense. And honestly, mm. there's plenty of gaps, I'm sure, that they've left in the past. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. we can go back to that and revisit that. Especially if Eighth Doctor, since he's much more of an audio doctor. Mm -hmm. And all of the all of the novels are of question question mark canon in the Big Finish continuity. Mm-hmm. All right, that's the end of our Doctor Who news, um, which brings us on to Geek Talk. So two items. First one, Polite Society. <laughs> and starting I will say, clock. I, I, I will say I just remembered to add Guardians 3 because I've seen that, but I'll leave that until after you do yours. Uh, but yeah, Polite Society. I kind of like, I honestly forget why. I decided to give this a shot, but I'm glad I did because it was a really good movie. Like, the basic plot is just that this girl thinks that there's something skeevy about, um, uh, the guy that her older sister is trying to, is like, is going to be marrying and, like, whether it's a matter of is this all in her head because she's too clingy to her sister or, you know, is there actually something nefarious going on? Um, and like that, this girl is like also an aspiring stunt woman as well as kind of a running theme throughout the movie. Honestly, it's a, yeah, like, it's really good. And the funny thing is, is this actually is appropriate to talk about on this because apparently this was the feature debut 
directorial wise for someone who had written stuff for Doctor Who if I remember right, if I remember right I'm just going to have to quickly thing her cuz I forget what their name was um Nita Manzor that's it um who had done directed Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror and Fugitive of the Jadoon. Mm. Um so that was like when I when I realized that cuz originally I was almost kind of like hmm the name does kind of sound vaguely familiar. Oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> she directed um, two episodes of Chimular and Doctor Who. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, and it's just, you know, it's not really much to say because if I go into, like, a lot of it, it kind of spoils a lot of it. But yeah, it's just, it, honestly, it's an interesting movie and I'm, ab- I'm definitely glad um, that I gave it a shot. And, like, if anyone is even vaguely interested in the idea of, like, a sort of... Effectively, it's kind of an action comedy following uh, a bunch of uh, British Pakistani immigrants. Um, You know... You could probably do worse. Uh, like, this is a really good movie. I'm very glad that I did end up seeing it. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I've got without just talking in circles. But yeah, definitely right. recommend it. Uh, and actually, I'm, I got a link here. So adding Guardians. Go ahead and talk about Guardians. Oh, yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> seeing, like, you know... I remember the previous two Guardians movies being a gut punch emotionally. Good lord. Um, (laughs) Guardians 3. It's like... It's interesting because I don't know whether I would say it is the best of the three or not because I haven't rewatched the other two. Of the four. Although that is um, technically the special, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, it's better than the special. <laughs> and, like, the special's, not, the special's not bad, but, you know, the special is a TV special, um, um, effectively. A so, lot of what I've been hearing, actually, is that a lot of people rate between one and two. Hmm. Like, a lot of people think one was a little bit better than two, and this still rates above two. Um... At least that's what a lot of opinions I've been hearing. Yeah. I mean, I know that I remember, like, for two, I felt that even if it wasn't as good as one, it was at least a worthy sequel. Yeah. Kind of a thing. Um, Three is, like... Three going into it, it's basically, like... I think even, like, I had the realization watching this movie of, like, oh, yeah, this is a trilogy about grief and trauma because <laughs> like and, that's, and how the that's people cope it, with it yeah yeah pretty much and like you know it's there are things that i didn't necessarily think about when watching it and watching a review someone made made me go oh yeah that was a bit of an odd choice but otherwise just like i will say Adam Warlock didn't need to be in this movie. He's just kind of there. <laughs> and the portrayal of him compared to what I know that he's normally like is like, well, that was a weird choice. Um, But, you know, like, whatever. Like, if we'd actually got him when we were supposed to, maybe it would have been different. Because, like, you know, he's teased at the end like he's teased in the first one and then they have to rejigger it and tease him again in the second one and now we finally get him and it's like eh um (laughs) I'm just glad that the the focus shifted to Rocket because like 
we've got all we really need from Star Lord, he can take a back seat. <laughs> oh, so it's as not a rom com like... about Star Lord and Gamora. And no. Um, in fact, like it's not even really much of a spoiler, so I will just say like it's it's kind of the plot with him and Gamora is just him being repeatedly told this is not the person you know that you had a thing with anymore like just mo- you've got to move on <laughs> like is like the whole thread of that it's like him wanting it to him wanting to start up with her again and her wanting absolutely none of it because you know this isn't that gamora <laughs> Um, so, you know, that was nice. Um, I feel like they give Mantis, like, a bit more to do, but not really. I hope that they do stuff with her after this. (coughs) Um, but we'll see. Like, I kind of, kind of hope she gets a Disney Plus show, to be honest. Um, because that would be nice. Um, but yeah, like it's interesting. It was interesting to note who some characters were that I didn't really know. Um, I did really like the High Evolutionary as the main villain. Um, arguably the only, I mean, Adam Warlock is kind of a secondary villain, not really, but you know. It's an, um, introduce, it's an introduction to a main character who's not always been on the right side, but eventually found their footing. Mm-hmm. And really, the main the main issue I have is just that there was like <laughs> that like I was always kind of hoping that the collector would come back and be a villain, yeah. like a main villain, because of what happened in the first movie. And then, like, for all we the know, he's, he's just basically just killed done. him. Well, yeah, it's like it's effectively implied that he did, but we never actually see it happen. Mm. So it's like he could be, but you know, maybe he also just bug it off. But yeah, it's very like I don't know. Maybe he died. Maybe he didn't. Like. It would have been nice. I guess it's just because I like the character and it's like, well, here's a setup you've got. They fucked up his collection. You know. Man. It seems like someone like that would go after them, but oh well. Um But I would assume he is dead given we haven't seen him back in any capacity or even reference since. Um but yeah, I would I definitely say it's worth watching. I think I forget how long it's going to be before it ends up on streaming. Probably a month or three. But uh, yeah. Um, the, the main feedback I've heard about learn. it was that it was good, but it was traumatizing enough that people are unlikely to want to watch it a second time. Any comments on that sort of uh, thing? Um, it didn't hit me in that way enough to where. I would not want to watch it a second time, but I absolutely could see why. It was one of those things where, like, I could definitely, yeah, like, as I'm watching it, I'm like, yeah, I think there was even Mm -hmm. someone who'd said that they, who had told me they weren't going to because of, like, you know, a lot of, pretty much everything High Evolutionary experiments on is animals, and yes, they're all CGI animals, um, you know, even the animals that are just straight up animals and not, you know, talking, walk, like walking, talking animals are all CG, but it's still like, while we're not shown much of it, it's still, in fact, yeah, we're not, the, it's really kind of tame compared to what the impression I was getting that some people had. But it's still there. (laughs) So it's like, yeah, this could, like, I could absolutely see 
how a lot of this would be just like way too much gotcha. for some people. This is absolutely not a movie to take kids to. I'll say that much. Like, of, I mean, I'd argue none of these really movies that kids should be seeing on their own as far as the Guardians movies goes because they lean slightly more adult um, just because that's James Gunn's thing. Um, but this one's absolutely like, yeah, do not let small children <laughs> watch this movie. <laughs> it's like, this might be a bit too much for them to handle. Um, but it does, the movie does, like, as bleak in moments as it can get, it still has that hopeful through line going and ends on a happy note. So it's like, okay, cool. We have the catharsis of we went through all this like fairly bleak to a point stuff but there was still like you know an uplifting ending rather than like everyone just being like completely drained and messed up (laughs) at the end of it. Um, I mean it's going to be interesting to see where the characters even go from here. Because honestly, I was expecting a like everyone to be killed off. <laughs> because it's like, well, he's probably not doing... And I think he's flat out stated. This is like his last Guardians movie. It's likely his last Marvel movie, given that he's, you know, a DC executive now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was expecting him to just to go, well, see ya, and just wipe them all out or something. But no. Um... I won't say who lives and who dies, if any do or all do or whatever. But yeah, I mean, like basically, we don't we don't get a TPK. But uh, beyond that, I won't say what happens. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say it's worth watching. But if it if you do feel that the the animal shit and just some of the general trauma stuff that comes up would be a bit much, it would absolutely be better waiting for like a guide that you can look through to see what the content warnings are to see if you'd be able to cope with it or if like what the time 14 minutes things are (laughs) what the time things are so you know okay is there too much in this to where I could not just skim through bits yeah, I'd say it's still worth watching, but if it's too much, then that's that's totally fair. And yes, Matt, I was waiting for a natural ending to move us along, but <laughs> it is now now uh, DOA. All right, so yes, for my one little thing, DOA, aka Dead or Alive, aka that movie that exists. So I've <laughs> mentioned before that I'm part of a podcast uh, that tries to meet once a week, if possible, and will cover movies. And some of them are movies I haven't seen before. How, how often does that one actually meet? Um, trying to think now. I think last time we met was for uh, Final Fantasy Spirits Within, uh, which I will not cover here. But I will say, uh, yeah, that movie's got more boring the more I watch it. Um, but I think it's been about a week, week and a half oh. since last so time. So more we awesome met. than us. <laughs> um, well, we've only got like six or eight episodes out, and we've been doing this now for almost two months. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah. So Dare Alive. Um, there's just all kinds of issues with this movie. <laughs> um, this movie tries to be. An action movie that features attractive women, throws them at the camera at every single angle you could possibly think of. Made by the guy, by the way, who made the Resident Evil movies. <laughs> Surprise, his wife wasn't in this thing. Um, yeah, in hindsight. <laughs> um, and... Honestly, most of the main characters in this don't look anything like their actual in-game counterparts. Matter of fact, they can't even call Raya, Ryu Hayabusa his, anything other than Hayabusa because they're f- probably afraid that calling him Ryu might bring make people think, wait, Street Fighter? No, <laughs> he's the, the ninja from uh, Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> 
Dang you all. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, DOA in the games shares the universe with Ninja Gaiden. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, they completely eliminated a lot of the characterizations except for like one guy who by the end of his arc, halfway through the movie, kind of starts to show a little more characterization. But up to that point, he's obnoxious and one-dimensional, and it's just like, I don't care. You're too late on this one. And the only other, like, two or three characters that actually look like the actual characters literally die off screen. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> um. So, yeah. It, honestly, if I wanted a movie like this, there's a dozen other movies like this, and all of them are shot better, acted better, written better. <laughs> mm. This it's it's atrocious, and it's no wonder why they never revisited this because that's this movie basically killed that <laughs> possibility outright. Mm. Uh, well, fun, I mean, funny, funny things to note. It though. also it also bombed horribly. Apparently, had a thirty million budget and didn't make over ten million back. <laughs> Not <laughs> surprised. <laughs> Uh, I would say that there's some interesting notes in this movie, though. Uh, there's a recurring thug who uh, his actor is the same one who played uh, uh, Liu Kang from the original two Mortal Kombat movies. <laughs> yeah, he's just nameless thug that gets beaten up by one of the ladies in the movie. That's it. <laughs> um, And also... Uh, Jeremy Irons, who also played the master for the TV movie. No, not Irons. Um, What's his name? Dang it. Eric, Eric Roberts. Roberts. Eric Roberts. Mm. Eric Roberts is the main villain for this movie, too. Mm. And I really did get this feeling that he phoned it in. If, if, you, <laughs> if you thought he was hammy at all in the Doctor Who movie, this this man just literally looked bored half the time. I, mean, I, I have been told that he has two two modes, ham and wood. Oh, this is wood. <laughs> this is heavy wood. This is this is him just going. I'm literally here for a paycheck. This is obnoxious. <laughs> uh. Um. But yeah, so it's 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 a lame duck of a movie with like maybe one or two genuinely entertaining parts, mostly because like they actually hired a wrestler to basically homage another wrestler, which was what the intent of the character was in the video games too. So that's like one of the other few characters mm. that did right, and he just makes like a brief appearance for like five minutes and leaves. Mm. I mean, Bass being played by Kevin Nash is hilarious because he yeah. was in a mm-hmm. group with Hulk Hogan, who ba- <laughs> Bass is supposed to be. But Nash is like very chill, of, yeah. so it's kind of weird. <laughs> he, he, he did it really well, so... Mm. That and... Uh, yeah, I... Yeah, it's just... Bleh. <laughs> this movie just... Bleh. <laughs> Oh, that's all I can say. It, it, it was at least, if nothing else, highly entertaining to hear my f- other co-hosts, who were are as big, if not bigger, DOA fans than me, just sitting there raging. And one in particular was just seething. <laughs> you remember how angry Randy got at uh, Angels Take Manhattan? Mm. That level, <laughs> that level of fanboy just seething at this movie. <laughs> Uh, that being said, it's still better. Th- <laughs> According to most of the people in the group, this movie is still better than uh, Jason Goes to Hell. <laughs> <laughs> so far, Jason yeah. Goes to Hell is our, uh, is our low boy, although there, it has been challenged a couple mm. times. <laughs> I mean, at least DOA has some like decent fight scenes, and I feel like it's a movie that kind of knows... <sighs> It, it's it, kind it, of I, I understand the movie's basic. trying to do decent fight scenes, but it's shot so poorly you can't really get into the action mm. is my problem with it, too. Mm. It's just so choppy and ugly. I don't blame a lot of the um, choppy action shots that they started doing in like the early 2000s. It's like, just pull the damn camera back and let them do it. If they can't do it, then maybe get somebody else. Hmm. But yeah, I think that covers most of my thoughts. Yeah, I'm already at six minutes. <laughs> All right. Very corny movie. Bring... 
So that brings us to Children of Earth Day 2. And sorry Starting about the Day with... 1 header here, folks. That's all we got. We yep. didn't have time to fix it. <laughs> I mean, we had time, but not bandwidth. But not bandwidth, yes. Bill cannot yeah. send it up to upload. Um, so starting with the summary by Alex. Okay, uh, yep. And three, two, one, go. Okay, following the previous episode, ending with the bomb inside Jack going off, we open to the aftermath, the destruction of Torchwood space. Uh, Gwen and Yanto managed to make it out relatively unscathed uh, and also managed to avoid being captured uh, with Gwen stealing some guns off someone who admits that he works for the government uh, that are trying to capture slash kill them. Uh, prompting Gwen and Reese to go on the run while Yanto goes to his family for help uh, while in the meantime the remains of Jack start to reform. Uh, after having been put in a body bag in captivity. <clears throat> uh, while Yanto is meeting his sister, uh, the kids, and by extension, uh, Clement, the old guy from the previous episode, uh, convey another message from the 456. Uh, this time it is, We are coming tomorrow. Uh, Gwen tries ringing the civil servant John Frobisher, who is the one who put the order out to kill them, uh, only to get as far as Lois, uh, the what sort of desk clerk there, uh, who decides to help them, uh, bringing Gwen and Reese information she has, including where the now fully reformed Jack uh, is being held. And while this is all happening they decide to fill Jack, flood Jack's cell with concrete, given they know they can't kill him. Um, uh, Gwen and Reese uh, end up intercepting and taking the place of someone who is coming to pick up the body of Rupesh, the guy from last episode. Uh, and while everything is going fine at first, messing with the cameras prompts the guy who's watching the cameras to sound the alarm. Uh, Gwen and Reese are almost captured, but at the last second, Yanto manages to come in and yank the cement block uh, containing Jack out of the side of the building with, I don't know, sort of a massive forklifty type thing. I'm not sure what the actual vehicle name for that would be. Um, but this provides an opportunity for Gwen and Reese to get out. Uh, with all three managing to get away, after blocking the road with a cement truck and shooting the fuel tank to set the truck on fire. Uh, the three then escape to, I'm guessing, a quarry where they break Jack out of the concrete block by dropping it from a great height, uh, basically off a cliff, uh, retrieving Jack and driving off. Uh, meanwhile, back with John Frobisher, we see uh, that what people have been building for the 456 is now ready, a room with a containment unit in it, uh, having what's effectively poison gas pumped into it, uh, with the assumption being that's what the 456 breathe, although they aren't entirely sure. Uh, the episode ends with John Frobisher nervously leading, uh, leaving the room after Mr. Decker says the aliens are purely coming for Britain, uh, but staying back in the room after the other two leave, and pressing up against a containment unit, uh, eerily breathing onto it to end the episode. And that's it. Yep. Yep. All right. 3.29 was your time. <laughs> there was, like, a lot of things. And, like, well, this is just, like, a conversation. Do I really uh. need to... <laughs> it was, like, hitting the main points. Right. I was surprised you spent as long on the beginning as you did cuz when I when I wasn't sure who was taking who was doing the summary, I was just like Gwen and Yanto escape the rubble while evading snipers. And I think mm. you stretched that part out to like 3 sentences. <laughs> All right. Um so starting with what we liked about the episode, um and I came up with Matt all right. What well, I liked about the episode, honestly, it doesn't seem to have dropped the ball so far. I'm really enjoying the uh, the mystery aspect of what we at least assume are aliens coming. 
Maybe it's a multi uh, another dimensional being. Who knows? Uh, still a bit of a mystery at, the, at this point. I feel like there's uh, certain characters like the old man that I wish would have gotten a little more time. But at the same time, I don't feel that they wasted what time they were given with all the other characters. They mm. needed to keep things moving. Yeah, the old man was just there long enough to be like, hey, remember, he's still in this story. And that was it. Mm -hmm. I wish there could have been more they could have done with him, but at the same time, again, uh, I feel that would have just m might have been running things a little too long and they had to chop something, I suppose. Right. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, in general, the, the overall story and the mystery behind it all has still been really interesting so far. I'm just kind of curious where this is going to lead to now. Okay. And, and it seems like they're at least getting close to being there to see what's going ha going on and what's happening. Hmm. They literally have like a few hours before the next morning. So. Hey, Alex. Um, I guess I like that, like the general idea that we didn't necessarily have to make at least to me like maybe if i watched it a third time uh it would come off one way or the other but i do like that this did not necessarily make either side seem incompetent because you've got like government agents going after them so why would they be incompetent i mean like you know there's a lot of main character shields everyone's <laughs> shooting but no one's getting hit but like you know gwen has to overcome those two guys in the ambulance to get free and like they've actually got snipers up on the roof because they're not you know like actually... they're they're taking this seriously and it's like well on the off chance that they manage to get out before the bomb goes off We'll pick them off with snipers, so it's like, you know, everyone's actually thinking. <laughs> and, like, we're actually, like, you know, we're not making the bad guys incompetent just so the good guys can get away. And, like, they basically have uh, Gwen and Reese at that one point, and it's only the fact that um that Ianto shows up when he does that opens up just enough of a moment for them to get out. And even then they're still being shot at by the time they finally do run off. Mm. So Bill? Alright. So I'm gonna say what I like is the way all of the uh the background characters from episode one that it kind of, like, there was no reason to think we'd ever see them again. Uh, I thought they were all used perfectly. Like, they were all used in a way that advanced the story, advanced their characters. You know, they were involved in the whole, um, you know, uh, dealing with the government thing in different ways. And for characters that could just as easily have never been seen again, I thought that was a really great use of all of them. Hmm. We had what we had uh Jack's daughter and grandkid. We had uh, mm, yeah. Yanto's sister oh, uh, and her family. Oh yeah, such the Yanto's mm. extended family. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean there's Re there's Reese, but I don't know if I if he counts because we knew we were gonna see Reese again. Oh, we, yeah, we know but, we have Reese. <laughs> like there was no way Reese was just gonna not be talked about again. <laughs> Even uh, hell if you count uh, that uh, other cop as Gwen's extended family. You know, oh, he's yeah. there vouching mm. for her, and he's like, what kind of terrorist doesn't try to kill anybody? <laughs> what kind of terrorist shoots the wheels out of a vehicle instead of actually ch killing people? Mm. <laughs> he's literally just calling them on their bullshit the entire time. Yep. <laughs> mm. And just further proving that they haven't convinced him. Mm-hmm. All right, so I guess we move on to what we disliked about the episode, starting with Matt. Ah, uh, I disliked about the story. 
Uh, well, the story in general. I will say, while the lady that showed up at the end of episode uh, one does seem to be a viable, th um, thinking on her feet kind of threat, I will say at the same time, though, she is the lousiest sniper I've ever seen. <laughs> she missed both Gwen and and Yanto multiple times. As a matter of fact, it was even literally down on the ground chasing Yanto and still missing with a sniper rifle. <laughs> I'm, I'm Be fair, if you're chasing somebody, a sniper rifle is not what you want to have. But, but it's just your, your one number one chance to be able to just literally stop, take aim, and literally get the easiest shot. You're in an right. open street. Mm. You're literally in an open street with nowhere for this guy to hide. How are you not taking a quick knee and getting him? <laughs> and again, they had multiple chances to get multiple good shots and mugged it every time. Mm -hmm. mm. This 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 poor lady, she may be clever, but she couldn't hit the broad side of a wind, <laughs> wind veil. <laughs> on, on a windless day, just <laughs> pew! Oh, missed the crow again. <laughs> or the chicken again. <laughs> I've been watching too much, um, too many DBZA commentaries because my first thought, like, my, my when my brain was filling in for you saying that, I was like, oh yeah, she couldn't hit the broadside of a space barn. <clears throat> I was like, no, that's, that's not what Matt's saying. <laughs> well, in Doctor Who, we could almost use that, I suppose. A time barn. Couldn't hit the broad side of a space barn. We get it. You're from space. <laughs> My space armor. All right, uh, uh, Alex. What did you dislike about this episode? Um. Hmm. Uh. God. Oh, all right. Um. God wasn't in this episode. <laughs> hmm. I, I'm starting to think you maybe just need a bass. <laughs> yeah, I might have to. Uh, it's, it's either that or maybe it's just that I can only think of potentially like scenes or something rather than overall... Yeah, it might, it might come down um, to that because, yeah, that was my big general one, and technically it was a scene, but it was multiple scenes in a row. Oh, that's... So. I just realized what I, what I had been planning to say probably counts more as... Well, it counts as several scenes, so I'll, I'll, I'll still say it. I guess I'll say, like, because it happens throughout, the fact that no one is su seemingly suspicious of Lois at all is a bit weird. Like, she's asking yeah. a lot of questions and all that, right. and like, and all this, but, and it's but like at the same time she's new, so they're they're kind of expecting mm. a little bit, I suppose. True, but it is kind of funny that like oh, yeah, with this... everything going on, how trigger happy they are, that they wouldn't immediately. Uh -huh. <laughs> This, You're like, you are asking a bit too many questions. Th this is like the third time they were like, that's not your job. And like, they yeah. haven't gotten like pissed or anything yet. So yeah, it's, mm. she does seem to have a bit, a bit of freedom in her top secret government job. Mm. <laughs> now, I guess the big question is, does she have, like, if she has somebody tailing her, you know, as part of just a general, like, yeah, this is how we treat new people, then that may be it. She might show up for episode three and be like, yeah, now uh, now you're under arrest or now you're being executed. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if she was able to just meet with them and give them secrets and nobody says anything, then a thousand percent, like, this is a little too convenient. Mm. Very so lucky. My, yep. So mine probably counts as a nitpick, and in fact, I'm sure it does. Um, but it's just, it was on my mind, so I have to say it. So I talked last time about how this felt like a movie and how it was playing out and how I really liked that. And this uh, one aspect, it's really obvious that it's a, a TV show that was probably aired either before Watershed 
or had a limited amount of budget or both. Um, and that is, you know, all of the interesting stuff with Jack happens off screen. The ref- yeah. when, they, when, when, they, when they brought him in as bits and he reformed into a skeleton, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, if they're, they're observing that with the camera, are we going to see that? Like, no, we see some we see some movement under a body bag. Are we going to see the skeleton <laughs> grow skin and turn into a person? No, that's just going to happen off screen. <laughs> and, you know, I like that would have been th- like the pinnacle of what they could do with Jack's powers. And we didn't see any of that. Mm. To, to be fair, I'm not sure you can. If you're especially if you're going to do it with modern visuals, it's going to be very hard to do it right. Mm. All you... they had to do was watch Hellraiser, and bring it <laughs> <laughs> and direct it like that. Yeah, you see, again, you need a bigger budget in order to do that. Like, don't get me wrong, they're doing really well with what they got, yeah. but they are not going to be able to That's why I say it's probably stuff. a nitpick. <laughs> There's, like, the BBC might not have allowed that, and also, yeah. if they had tried, it might have been worse, because, I mean, we've, we saw, we all saw meat. Like, yeah. their, their budget, their, their at least, yeah, their, their effects the, budget is not great. No, yeah. their effects budget has been proven multiple times but in they, the franchise to not they, be very good. <laughs> They teased it and then didn't carry through, so I had to mention it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And yet, I would argue that sometimes your imagination is better for it. So, shrug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, favorite scenes, starting with Matt. Favorite scene, honestly. Uh, what's her name? The secretary. Uh, Lois. Lois. I I kind of I kind of felt that, that it was gonna happen, uh, but I wasn't sure when. Just seeing that gradual heel turn to yeah, I'm gonna help them instead of writing them out to my bosses who are doing obnoxious, horrible things to them, and I'm pretty sure are trying to kill them from everything I've seen. <laughs> because mm-hmm. it seems like they're generally trying to help, and they're literally managing to survive everything my bosses are throwing at them. And I don't know why they're, why they're doing it, but it seems like they're not helping the situation. In fact, maybe making it worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, she she was she so far is the only one who's just like, yeah, I didn't get this job to kill random people, right? Yeah. So far, uh, none of the like none of the actual people with guns have had that thought. <laughs> I'm not here to kill innocents. I'm here to actually try to help my country. Just a thought. <laughs> okay, Alex. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna go with. It's funny because it's like I have two in mind. It's a matter of narrowing down which because they both involve Yanto's family. <laughs> Um, well, that's good because I have two in mind, and one of them involves Yanto's family, and the other doesn't. Um, you know what? It's it's funny as so I'll go with it, but the one where they storm into the house and like have the guy he's like naked in his bed, and they're fucking pointing guns at him, just being like. We're like we're looking for Yanto Jones. He's like, you won't find him in my bed, will you? I'm a married man. I figured that that was one of one of your two. Yeah, that was a good Cause, one. Yeah, because <laughs> like, and it's like I think it's mainly so funny because he's so reacting so chill to being at gunpoint. <laughs> Although that's that's two naked men Russell has included in this episode. Yep. <laughs> um. So since I'm last and there's only three of us, I'll say both of the scenes I have in mind. Uh, one is the one where I'm pretty sure this is um, Yanto's brother-in-law. I, I think he was the one who was basically like he saw the government surveilling them, and he was like, mm. "Oh, you you're here to uh, to creep on little kids, right?" And they <laughs> got yeah. the whole neighborhood to fuck with the car. Yeah. Yeah. Was that your that other was, one or no? Yeah, that was my it, other one. 
<laughs> uh, and the other one is the scene in the um, in the base where they're like freeze and like drop your guns and you're like okay Gwen's not gonna drop the gun because she knows they're just gonna kill her if she does but then you see like she's slowly doing it stalling for time and then Yanto bursts through the fucking do through the wall like <laughs> yes like that's an awesome awesome scene of you know Torchwood being competent which in mm. some of in some Torchwood especially I think Especially season two, probably you get a lot of Torchwood being incompetent. Here, mm. there, there's a lot of Torchwood being competent. And let's, well, yeah. let's also face facts. This is some of the more competent members to begin with. <laughs> there are certain members that only left after season two that were the really incompetent ones. <laughs> but then mm. again, there was also certain episodes where they randomly made everyone incompetent just to let the villains go right. for another half of episode. I was going to say this. I was going to say, Owen was competent when he was present, sober, and being a doctor. Right. Or even, I mean, he was a competent agent, generally, when he was when he gave a crap. Yeah. And wasn't going on some sort of bend. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tosh? I mean, she was definitely competent in her area. I think there, she had weaknesses, but... She had certain mm -hmm. weaknesses, and sadly, one of them was Owen. <laughs> ah, yes. Mm. And, um... Mermaids. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, least favorite scenes. Ooh, least favorite scene. Yep. Um. Hmm. I, I have to say, I think that last scene with the guy going up to the big case of poison gas and like <sighs> on it it's like okay this guy was already kind of weird now he's officially going on the creepy right <laughs> I've been kind of treating that scene as okay that scene is a sneak peek at next week and I don't mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily know what's what's going on so I've been kind of just you know sweeping it under the rug but yeah Definitely uh, a little odd. <laughs> Someone wants to get way too close to the aliens, and it's not looking good. <laughs> mm. He'll be the first to die. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's my that's my one go to really like what the heck scene. Mm. All right, Alex. Um. I guess while I don't have a problem with, like, anything particular in the scene as far as dialogue or acting or whatever, I mean, the fact that they're on the run from the government but decide, you know what, let's meet in, like, a little cafe or whatever <laughs> is very, like, just like a little... R little restaurant cafe so, thingy somewhere. For something it's like that, like... generally the um the, the rationale behind it is this is a secret organization. They're not going to just burst in and shoot up the cafe. Well, right, but I mean, like you know, walking it like walking into a place that's like, okay, well, this is still somewhere that they could come in and grab you or like probably see you from outside or something like that and like um you know paying for stuff i mean yeah he's not using his money to pay for it because he's gotten on um but it's still just funny of like well that's just more people that have seen you <laughs> um and it like is it's really like it is more of a nitpick but it is just kind of like don't know why you'd be meeting in like that kind of a place. Granted, I don't know. I guess you know. I give it a bit of slack because it's like, okay, where would they? I mean, like they can't meet in like a park because that's a bit <laughs> open. And I mean, like, yeah, Yantar does, but like, you know, they probably assume that he's long gone from the area by then. So. You know, it's very like 
in that particular instance, I just remember thinking, well, it's weird that no one spotted them. Especially because you would almost kind of think that with on high alert that they are, that Lois would have been getting tailed. Mm-hmm. And so it is kind of funny that she ultimately, I guess she wasn't. So that's a bit odd, but, you know. And, like, I guess pulling out all these documents and that and just having this very frank conversation when there's a lot of people around. If it was, like... I don't know if a dive bar would be the right thing, but that kind of a thing where, like, during the day, there's not going to be many people in there. You can just find a little corner to sit in and be like, yep, okay, now we're, like fairly private but technically in a public space <laughs> um yeah i don't know like again it's more of a nitpick because it's there isn't much that really like notably bugs me but yeah i think that's all i've got for that and i'm i've been trying to think of what scene irks me the most and i think it's going to have to be the scene where Lois just walks up to Frobisher and she's like, I was listening to your conversation and I'm just going to keep bugging you with questions. And I'm like, <laughs> um, you, you like, on one hand, you know that like they just put a hit out on somebody that who was calling them offering to help. Um, mm. On the other hand, you, it's not the first time they've mentioned that like she needs to just be, you know that the, she's there for admin work and not to be involved in what they're doing. And secondly, just the fact that they don't react like they react to it, obviously, but not they don't like we were saying before. Like they don't react to it. They they don't get suspicious. In mm. fact, they give her more information. Okay. Um, and I'm and I'm like, why do you trust her like that? Because. <laughs> she doesn't trust you and you, you know, like you're not, you know, t- she's the one who's not doing the normal stuff of her job from mm-hmm. the first scene. She was on screen. I was like, is she a spy? Cause she's acting like a spy. <laughs> like, why do they not suspect she might be a spy? Like mm. considering what they do. So yeah, the <laughs> fact, that, the fact that that was like such a, a, a non issue and they never really, you know, addressed her or, you know, in any serious way is would have to be my least favorite scene. And if 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 we find out that she's not being looked into and not being tailed or anything like that, then that really makes me double down on that being, you know, the worst scene. Hmm. All right, uh, so that brings us to final thoughts. Starting with Matt. Um, I will say so far, I decided, I mean, the picks, uh, I still think this is a pretty solid episode. It hasn't completely dropped the ball or anything yet, and they have done some very interesting stuff that we have not been able to see in the regular TV series so far. But I am also very interested in seeing what this mystery pans out to be. Hopefully it's not a letdown, but I have heard there's supposedly bad things about the story so we'll see hopefully part three continues to stay on the mark but uh i hear it goes wrong at some point maybe so <laughs> for right now episode two pretty good okay alex yeah it's like i mean this is definitely one i'm glad that we're saving ratings for the end of the story because like this is one where i'm like yeah this is a an episode it's not a bad one i don't know if it's a particularly great one either it's just you know we we've the story is continuing to move forward and it hasn't lost me yet um so that's nice <laughs> like yeah it's like there's a lot of good like i'm noticing so far that a lot of the things in this that I appreciated were little things like, yeah, we get more of Yanto's family who, as was brought up before, they could have easily, we could, you could have easily assumed episode one would have been it and they would have never shown up again. Mm -hmm. And then they show up again. Like, I don't know if they're going to show up in like the next couple episodes, but at the very least them showing up more than once 
I was like, hey, that's nice. Especially because we've got, like... Aside from him angsting over his dead girlfriend a lot in, like, series one, <laughs> like, we haven't really got much out of Yanto, so it's nice mm -hmm. to get that. I mean, I know why we are, but it's <laughs> it's it's nice to get it at all, especially when you consider, like, we maybe got 10 minutes on Tosh total in two series and Owen was just kind of shitty. So any background we got, I didn't really care. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's nice. And like, you know, Gwen was the main character. So of course we got stuff on her, but yeah, it's just like, it's nice. I hope that keeps going to a point. Um, I'm definitely hoping this story doesn't shit the bed, but, you know, I mean, the main takeaway for me from this was like, you know, when we lost Tim, we had the Dominators, which was very campy and fun and like kind of bad, but, you know, in a fun way. We lose Randy and we're doing Torchwood and it's like, hmm, <laughs> this yeah. is going to hit different. <laughs> right. So, it's like, uh, I mean, I'll say this much. At least this was a lot more lighthearted <laughs> for Torchwood, this particular episode. With all the shit going on, no. it's not as bad as Torchwood can get with how yeah, dark So far, it at gets. least, yes. <laughs> and, the, yeah, and as, as Matt alluded to, not as bad as this story has a reputation for being. So, mm. we'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's it for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I really like the way this story, had, or this episode was just pretty much a, you know, on the run from the government episode. Um, it's all of the, you know, you know, all the the uh, tropes and, you know, eff effectiveness that that entails. It definitely um, it was kind of funny having an episode where it's just... Uh, Jack is the damsel in distress that they spend the episode saving. Uh, but yeah, I really, I really liked it in a lot of ways. There were some, uh, some issues that are mostly in the realm of minor nitpicks, at least at this stage. Um, but I definitely got a kick out of you know all of the things involved. With, you know the, they were very effective in their. You know there was a. Hell, even like the comedy bits of Reese being like, oh, well, I've never been on the, I've never gone into hiding before, have I? Uh, you know, and just the way that that was carried out. I thought that was done really well and could really be the, you know, the backbone of a, of a movie around this sort of thing. So altogether, it was a, it was a good part. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it did its job. They uh, recovered Jack, who's now naked in the back seat. Um and it's uh, now to see what happens next week. Uh, so that is the end of our review since we're not doing ratings, mm -hmm. um, which might be problematic if uh, more of us have health slash work schedule issues. Because um, mm -hmm. if it takes us five months to review this, it's going to be a problem. Uh, but let us know in the comments. Us. Yep. Let us know in the comments what you thought of this week's episode. If you've watched it, don't forget to like the video since you listened this far. And make sure to subscribe on YouTube to get our exports every time we stream or follow us on Twitch to get stream notifications. Next time, which we are hoping will be next week, but we've been wrong before, we continue on with Children of Earth with Children of Earth Day 3, written by Russell T. Davies and starring John Berriman as Captain Jack Harkness, Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper, and Gareth David Lloyd as Yanto Jones. We'll see you then. Good luck, have fun. <laughs>